Well, Bismarahim, um, assalamu alaikum everybody and thank you to the Abrahamic Foundation for such a wonderful invitation, introduction. Thank you, Brother Nasser and Molina. So lovely to meet you, all of you. I thought the best thing I could do is probably share a little bit about my story, how I got here, how I'm still here, um, and also what is the vision? What are we looking towards? You know, why is this important? You know, a year and six months ago, my life completely changed. I didn't have any aspiration to become a Secretary General. I didn't really know what on earth that was till I joined the MCB. And I also didn't know what's the power or the potential. But I remember in COVID, you know, there was so much happening. The MCB was this really important organization. I was involved. But also deep down, I knew that we needed change as communities. And we needed leadership and institutions that reflected who we are in our full diversity as women and as men, as young people, and even ethnically we're so diverse, religious traditions. So I remember someone saying, well, the elections are coming up. What do you think? I said, you're crazy? What do you mean, what do I think? Who's going to vote for me? And, but someone else said, said to me, well, isn't it about time? You know, uh, and I thought, wow. You know, and they said, if Allah opens a door to good, shouldn't you take it? If you have the opportunity to change something, why not? And so I put my hat and my hijab in the ring and you know, I was up against a very prominent imam. We did a live Islam channel TV hustings. We were both doing it for different reasons, but my driving force has always been my passion for community change. Just like everybody in this room, we want to see something different. We don't know if we can really do it, but we'll give it a go, right? And if Allah puts Baraka in it, then we'll change something. So I remember the moment I got elected and they announced a the result. I did not think this was going to be a big deal. <laughs> I didn't think this would change my life forever. Within the hour, Guardian's on the phone, BBC's on the phone, Times is on the phone, Telegraph is on the phone. I was averaging nine interviews a day that week and people could not believe that mosques and imams, predominantly men, had voted for this 29-year-old Glaswegian <laughs> to be the head of the largest and most diverse representative body in the UK. It was phenomenal. And they said, oh, she's just going to be a puppet. So then the media came and got involved because obviously it was too big a story. She's just a puppet. She's a pleasant face of, away from a bearded, cross-eyed man. Cross man. That's literally a quote from the Telegraph. You know, it's, it's a pleasant change from, you know, the bearded guy. Um, they said, you know, she's a token. And then I had my Radio 4 interview, which you probably all, Women's Hour, it went viral. That was day four. People don't know I had tougher interviews than that. I dealt with uh, you know, Magnus from The Times, one hour of every Islamophobic trope you can imagine. So do you think it's okay for young girls not to wear headscarves? What do you think of homophobia? What do you think of homophobia? What are you asking me? You know, is my answer gonna, was my answer going to be different, you know? Um, and the Women's Hour interview, the, I was told this was going to be really lovely. It was going to be intimate. They wanted to know more about me. So it's called Women's Hour. I've been doing so many interviews, so obviously I've not really had time to look up the journalist. And they're telling me it's going to be a really lovely interview. So I, it's not like I've got my guard down, but I don't really have any reason to believe it was going to be difficult. So obviously it's a live Zoom. And there's loads of ladies in the meeting. You, you, can, you guys can see it, but there's loads of people watching. The story before my story, she's really lovely and nice. Then I come on and she changes completely. Hostile, aggressive. And the minute she builds this question up, you know, so you're from the MCB and you're claiming this and that, but what about how many female imams are there? And I'm like, oh my God, really? Like, is this relevant? And it got, you know, it went on and on and on. And I quickly realized that this interview was not about me or the achievement or about our communities. This was yet another attempt to trivialize, stereotype. It's like, you know, it was a very, you know, that whole, or Muslims, you know, we're not here for all of society. We're just doing our own thing. But anyway, obviously, there was a huge backlash afterwards. But people don't know, even after that interview, I had two more interviews that whole week. People were asking me the FAQ and everything Muslim. And I thought to myself, like, that's not why I got elected. It's not why I'm here. And it's not why I'm here to represent communities. We're here to do something meaningful, to change something. And you're asking me, you know, about all the silly questions that you've been always asking us. And so I also realized how much has changed in regards to the perception of British Muslims? How much do people really know about us any more than before? 
Sadly, despite our diversity, I'm third generation, they still have the same view of us as the other. And I'm generalizing, we talk about media here and, and perceptions. So I quickly, so I said stop, no more interviews. So I didn't, I wasn't elected to be famous. I was elected to get a job done. And so, you know, for the year and six months that I've now been in term, I've been, I said, I want to go visit the affiliates as soon as the restrictions allowed me to. I've been, you know, Blackburn, <laughs> Leicester, Manchester, obviously lots in London. Wales, I just did four day trip. People say, well, why, why would you need to go for four days to Wales? I said, because shouldn't we meet all of our communities in the most hard to reach places? Shouldn't we share their stories? And I was saying to Brother Nasser about this fantastic youth project in Liverpool, the Al Ghazali Trust, led by women, ran by women, now employing 17 year old boys to run the centre. And they say, the boys love to chill here, but the girls want to go out. And in Wales, this youth centre, keeping the guys, you know, keeping people off the street, they said, our girls want to do sports. Our girls want to do sports now. They want to know why can't they, you know. And there was a brother I met in Leicester. He said, my daughter wanted to play football, so I just set up a team for her <laughs> so she could do it, you know. So the point being is our young people are changing so much and what they need from us is changing. And on the other side, I've obviously been visiting the institutions and having a chat with them and saying, well, we're going to let women in now or, you know, we're going to try and be more inclusive. But it's a very polite, respectful conversation but the idea is that 50% of Muslims in the UK are under the age of 25. So half of everybody I represent is young and on the other side of that we have an aging population. So our, they're just like the UK we're living longer and so we have a huge kind of little population older but half of us are all young. So if half of us are young, can we confidently say that a young British Muslim today feels that they can attain anything they want? Do they feel confident about themselves? And it's not just identity or religious, because young people today don't really bracket themselves in that anymore. They've got an online identity. So they've got friends all over the world. You know, when, we, when the Palestine stuff happened, for example, our young people were very, very emotive on the topic. They may not have had a strong religious identity, but in that moment, they felt very charged. And they didn't have a forum to talk about it. Madrasas could have facilitated how to speak about this kind of topic in a, in a healthy way. Our women, young Muslim women, we are the most marginalized when it comes to employment. So if you're visibly Muslim, this is the Women Equality, the Parliamentary Commission evidence of all the minorities, Muslim women are the most marginalized when it comes to employment. Now take that and also remember that 40% of us are in the most deprived areas in the UK. So our women are really suffering. Because if you don't have good economics, you don't, if you don't have the ability to have a job and to earn, then when you've got social issues, which we're really good at, like domestic abuse, prison population, what are your options? What can you do? So actually, financial literacy is really important. Knowing jobs and economics are important, but also political literacy, you know. I've met both sides of the, the political divisions. I've met politicians from all the parties. And I think at this moment, there isn't really a stronghold in any side. Muslims politically are struggling because we are good for, like Islamophobia, right at the top. You know, we've had politicians making, you know, jokes about Muslims and, and burqas, you know. We've had councillors saying racist things, even within parties, Labour and Conservative. So my point being is, we don't have strong political power anymore, but we've got a huge vote. You know, I think the census data, which we're going to be analysing, maybe more than 3 million Muslims in the UK, probably a bit more than that. So I think in terms of looking ahead, this year will mark 25 years of the MCB. It's 25 years, right? So I, my question is, well, what does the next 25 years look like? Do we actually have a vision for our community and ourselves? I think this place definitely has a vision, but look at it nationally. Where do we see ourselves in this country? Because this is our country now. And in terms of the social issues that we do have, one of the chaplains said that, Zara, we're about 14% in prison population in the UK. But 14%. We don't even make that much of the population. What are we doing? There are areas in the north, areas in London, where you know a huge percentage are Muslims in that prison. Okay, we might not be able to stop the problem, but what are we doing about post-prison rehabilitation? What are we doing about the people that are 
you know, we don't really want to touch them in our community. They're going through tough issues, you know. What about our scholars? I've had some wonderful engagements with, you know, British-born imams and the role that they can play in helping talk to our young people, understanding the culture and the context that they're in, how to revamp the institution. So I think we need to have a bold vision for ourselves. And obviously in my tenure in the MCB, yeah, we've got a bold vision, an inclusive vision, a confident vision. And that's why if you've seen my interviews, I always say to people, what inspired me to run for this role, I was just really sick of us being like our head down and not feeling confident about who we are and like, oh my God, it's a terror attack, what are we gonna do? I had two terror attacks when I got elected. And I was like, you knew this was coming, Zara, so were you ready? With the murder of David Amos, and we had Liverpool. And I remember everybody feeling so anxious. And I said, well, I'll take the interview. Like, if we've got to do it, we've got to do it. And I said, well, we have nothing to be apologetic for. We didn't do anything. These are crazy people, as was found. These are crazy people. They do not represent us unequivocally. This is not who we are. We work with the mosque, we work the com community. But as soon as that happens, hate crime increases, more security has to increase, and we get another little spot on Muslims attacking us, you know? So I think we need to feel confident about who we are, confident about our future, but also bold enough to take some steps. And I think visiting communities and visiting the center gives me a lot of confidence that we're doing that because you're going against the grain, you're doing something differently, and you're understanding that you've got to take people with you. And that's really our philosophy at the MCB as well, which is diversity is important. You know, we have to show a leadership that is British, but also that can lead everybody, irrespective if they're Muslim or not. We're good for everybody, you know, our faith is here. Someone said to me, Zara, if it wasn't for the churches, the mosques, the synagogues, the temples, we just wouldn't have eaten during the pandemic. If it wasn't for faith communities, we just would have gone, because there are people who are just missed by the system. You know, the lonely uncle or the non-Muslim. And I remember a mosque in, in, in London, so the ladies did the, the food bank drop off and the funeral care providing services. And they said, there's these old people, uh, white English people, and they just so look forward to us dropping off. It's the first conversation they'll have. Just someone dropping off some food for them, you know, and say, how are you? And they just want to chat and they're just so happy. So we know we can provide that good. And you were saying that this area is a deprived area, right? So our goodness is not just limited to ourselves. It's to all of humanity. I think that's the action on us. But yeah, so it's, it's been a challenge. It's been high intense. But every time I go visit communities, I'm just so inspired to keep going. And every time I see like an, a young block of females and some males too, I always say to them, I hope you know I might be the first, not the last, and we're waiting for you. So whilst I hang out with the 50 year olds, like, you know, <laughs> I'm doing it on your behalf. <laughs> whilst I deal with all the Molinas, the lovely Molinas and all the uncles, it's because it's important for everybody to come after and feel that they can. So I will stop there, but happy to take some Q&A and just honestly thank you so much for the invitation and for just sharing so much, um, because I will absolutely share it, you have that commitment, but also it's, it's encouraging for me to know that people are doing this work. You know, they're just getting on with it. No, you know, not too much social media, we're just getting on with it because we're here to provide. So yeah, just like, okay, I'll stop now. <laughs> yeah, so any, any, any yeah, questions? Yeah, happy to take some Q&A. Another question, just a thought when you were talking about the pandemic and domestic abuse against women. But when I'm at work some other time and I hear loads and loads of reasons why this has happened or why that has happened and we, we work in the criminal courts, I always think back in my head, Abraham Crowley mm -hmm. could have helped this couple, Abraham Crowley should have helped this youth, somebody should have just phoned, though, and he should have just phoned the helpline, you know just to say, I need some support, I can't cope with today. And I feel lucky that we have a Foundation, and we have this support system, where lots of my evenings, if I'm feeling really bored at home, I've got nothing better to do, just come here, there's nothing mm. else on, just pray and go. But lots of people don't have that venue, that place to go to, and the more we speak about it, the more awareness it creates. Somebody down the road will just go and make one for themselves, because this has to be close to home as well. So I think um, what you're doing is absolutely great. And what we're doing, we need more of it to happen, it should be, so that people understand the need of it. Absolutely, definitely, totally agree with that. I think people just, everybody wants to belong somewhere and feel that there's a place that they can go to and be themselves. 
And it's difficult when we've got lots of divi dividing lines and conditions and who can come in. But it's the, the most important thing, I think, is just local people that take the step, just take the first step. And you'll find, you'll be surprised that although there's lots of negative stories, there's a lot of positive stories where people just helped because they wanted to. I think the more we see of that, then you'll get your Abrahamic foundations popping up everywhere. They might not just have the same name, but <laughs> it's the model, right? It's, everybody's welcome. Do you want to ask something? Or, oh. Oh. Do you know, like, becoming part of the BMC, how did, how, what was your journey in order to get there in the first place? To become someone so influential, how did you get there? What was your journey to being that? Oh, I don't even know. I mean, I just say like Allah chose it and that I just went with it. So a university, I mean, I put my hijab on in second year of uni. So I wasn't even in like the Muslim club. I went to a white school. So, you know, where are the Muslims there? I joined the Islamic Society. So I was really involved in the ISOC. But I used to meet like everybody. I'd hang out in the student union. They know me really well. I did my law degree. I think it was just, I just wanted to be involved. And I couldn't really find that in the community space. But at university, like, Everyone's involved. Student life is like everyone's involved. And then I got involved in FOSIS, the Federation of Student Islamic Societies, which is a member of the MCB. But in, in all honesty, you know, although the journey is there, I think it's A, I always had a sense of purpose that I wanted to serve. And B, like just praying to Allah, like if you want, whatever you want me to do, I'm at your service. So just guide me to what that path is. But I think it helped that being part of an Islamic society, being part of a national organization, obviously volunteering in the MCB as well. Um, but you don't know, like leadership is not something you choose. You are chosen for it. And it comes with a heavy responsibility. So whilst it can look glamorous or it can look good, someone said to me once in FOSIS in my student days, do you know that for all the good that you do and the people who follow you do it, you'll be rewarded? For all the bad that you do, and people follow that bad, you'll be punished. And I was like, okay, so don't look forward to leadership. As in, you feel a heaviness on you. But the way that I see it is that, look, we're human, we'll make mistakes, but we just strive for it. In my role, the margin for error is more or less zero. Like, if I make a mistake, it's going to be a really big deal, and it will impact a lot of people. So when I did the LBC interview, they had been after me for about six months. So this is the biggest radio station in London. It was drive time. They have millions of people listening. It was a drive time show, 7 to 9 p.m. So I think it was 7 to 8 p.m. I did the hour. So they were after me for a while. And there was like terror attack. I said, oh, I won't do it right now. It would be bad. There was another scandalous story. But anyway, the week that I did it, there was another news uh, breaking story about Nuskani and allegations of Islamophobia. I did 20 interviews in two days for that. Then I went to London, and this interview was on the Thursday with Ian Dale. You know, so I didn't know if he was going to be nice to me or not. You know, you could have just asked me lots of awkward questions. But we did a bit of prep. I prayed Maghrib. I called my mum. <laughs> said, Mum, we're going to be live. Like, what? She said, it'll be fine. It's in the kitchen, cooking. You know the usual. I said, it'll be fine. Just do what you do. Women, do you not understand the gravity of the situation? She obviously was not interested. She was just do what you always do. And you'll be fine. So I get to the studio. And I said, O oh, turner of the hearts, turn his heart towards me. And I said, Bismillah, we're here now. And I knew in that moment, I didn't represent myself. I didn't represent the MCB. Who did I represent? Everybody. So what the margin of error? Can I make a mistake? If I make a mistake, it's, it's on all of us, right? So I sat there. And what's the first question they asked me? why don't you represent the Ahmadiyya community? <laughs> that was the warm-up. That was the warm-up. So, well, we both laughed. <laughs> well then, so, and you can watch the interview so you can see, but as in, you know, straight in, and they, they screen the calls, so they know, they know what they're doing, you know? They screen the calls. And that was the first question I got, and I just took a deep breath, and I just handled it, because I thought, well, let's answer. Let's do these. So, the way that I see it is, you know, my job is, is one of great responsibility. And so I wouldn't necessarily seek it out, but all of us in our respective spaces are leaders or influencers or change makers. And I was saying to a, a Muslim mama's group the other day, I said, sometimes we all want to be the leader, but the supporters are really important. You want to meet a change maker, but there's so many people around you, if they don't facilitate, someone had a dream for Abrahamic Foundation and a whole bunch of people got around that dream. 
if we don't have people supporting us and behind us and around us and pulling us up, we can't achieve great things. And that's what, you know, my role in the MCB is it's not about Zara, it's about all of us. So before that visit, I had visited a ladies group. They said, we're going to root for you, Zara. You'll be great. We're going to call in as well. And they just gave me a little bit of encouragement. I thought, okay, when we go into the ring, we're going to go in strong and confident. But yeah, it was a terrifying experience. But again, margin for error was small. And I think my confidence and experience does come from university, does come from my exposure and Islamic work, but also comes from the drive that we just have to do better. And so, you know, if Allah wills it, we'll do it. So yeah, just as I'm having flashbacks, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Have you guys seen this interview? You know, watch it now. And, yeah, you want... It was a good answer on the MDS. So yeah, it, got, it went viral, that. So you got to watch it then, yeah? And give me some feedback. Um, apart from the responsibility, when you make mistakes, um, you have your voice with so many people. What do you find comfort in? What's the thing that makes you, like, brings you back up after you make a mistake if you were to make one? Oh, I do make mistakes, don't worry. Just not on TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, I always think, I mean, look, prayer is always really important. Mm -hmm. But more uh, that, taking a walk, a really long walk, just go for a walk, calm yourself. But family, my family's pretty nice. They're pretty good to me. They feed me, mum mom feeds me. So, <laughs> are you okay be eating? You know, we've got to love our mothers. They, do they always check. I think getting out of the bubble and going into like a normal space, having normal friends, having a normal, you got to remember that when you're in this environment, everything becomes super sensitive and you're really focused. But to get, you need to take a step back, go to your family, go to your friends, go do something else and remember that, you know, you're part of a bigger picture. It's not all on you. And there's people who came before you and who'll come after you. So don't take all of that pressure. But I think taking some time out, taking a break, going to people who make you feel good, taking a walk, taking a deep breath, um, and then try again, right? Just don't give up. Mistakes are good for you. They teach you a lot. I've made plenty of mistakes, lots and lots. But I've had a very steep learning curve. With every mistake, I always think it's not the mistake that's important, it's what you do after. So if I upset someone, someone in the team was really upset with me, so oh my God. So I just dealt with it, call it, I'm really sorry, that was my intention. How can we make this better? What can we do? You know, so just rectify it. Don't let it fester. If you let things fester, then you go crazy. And then I think having, I think you've got to like yourself. It's quite important. I know it sounds silly, right? But you've got to like who you are. If you don't like yourself, then it's going to be difficult. So if you don't like who you are, how can other people like you? Yeah. If you don't trust yourself, how can other people trust you? So you have to kind of really believe in what you say and do. I think, and that's really important. So, like, throughout what you've done now, it's like you've got a <laughs> This is great. <laughs> brother, uh, brother Nasser can go. Yeah. I don't know who's... It's good. One last one, then, yeah? Uh, throughout what you've done... She goes to me, what's the prefect of the class? I didn't know I was the prefect. <laughs> I think we... Yeah. You know, I, I do actually think you are. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, throughout what you've done, it's like you've come to Spethic. So, like, you've done to other things as well. What's the most important thing you've gained from it, like experience-wise, what's your favorite thing about having to do all of this? Mm. I love the school visits, if I'm honest. The primary school visits are hilarious. Those kids ask crazy questions, really crazy questions. Something we can't repeat, <laughs> you know. Uh, we had Dr. Shazad, he'll be joining us tomorrow once. I said, oh, I said, what do you guys want to become? I want to be a doctor. And I said, well, we've got one of the brothers who's a doctor. How many chemistry tests did you have to do to become a doctor? <laughs> and we're just laughing our heads off. And then one, one of the young boys, I think, he said, are you proud of yourself? Oh my God. I was like, you've cut me deep. Is this really? I said, I don't, oh my God. It shook. You know when kids ask you like just really piercing questions you never thought about? But the kids are so perceptive. So I love the primary school visits. Because I always think to myself, you know, I went to a white school. Imagine a young female hijabi standing at the front of my class saying that she's some big leader. Like, wow, you know? So for these young kids, you know, I can represent something really different for them. Or like there was one kid, I saw you on YouTube. <laughs> wow. So I think for me, the school, like visiting communities and being connected to the truth that they have, like what is really going on? Otherwise you're kind of in your little castle and yeah, we're doing national work, it's really great, you know, but you don't actually know what's going on so you can't help people. And I think sharing that is so important. So yeah, I love meeting people, but I love meeting kids. Young kids are just hilarious. Um, and they just come up with the craziest things, but they remind you 
they, they keep you humble too, right? So <laughs> they just remind you what's important. Maybe people can ask a question. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say, you've probably visited a lot of centers across the whole of the yeah. UK. With leads from all areas, from our students to our personal section, to our management section, to the teaching sections, to the trustees uh, all being here, the imams being here, what message do you uh, have for us having gone around Mm. What our priority should be, what we should do, what short message to Yeah, no, I think it's it's a really good question. It's a really critical question. I think we need sustainable forward planning. So we seriously have to stop thinking. Look, I know COVID kind of like puts off track, but it was also good. It highlighted things. I think every organization to assess what we're really good at, where are our gaps, and where are our blind spots. There are things that are going on. Sometimes we chase like the easy stuff we're all good at, right? And prayer, prayer facility, but madra, you know, there's foundational things and there's loads of resources for them, we can build them. There's a lot of things that are difficult and hard to reach. Some of it is how is our financial stability, how are we going to secure our future? You know, are we covered on that? What's the business model? Other things are, are we training our future leadership? That's great. Then other things are like, well, where are we on policy? So, you know, when you conquered like your foundations, is there places that we can shape policy and I mean that like you know if there's, if there's a poor area and you said attainment is really poor as well educationally so whilst you have the infrastructure and the support when people leave this building what's waiting for them I'm not saying you can fix that problem but surely you can help engineer networks of support pathways or connections or you could lobby those that can provide that solution so I went to a center similar to this where they're pretty much good on all the different areas but I said but have you got a bit of a a, a plan? Have you got an impact report? Are you sharing what you do? Are you creating best practice? And have you got a plan of like, what's, what are we going to conquer in two to three years? What are the sections we're going to hit? Because the community is going to need us. We have a cost of living crisis. We're in a recession coming up. We've got a mental health pandemic already upon us. We've got a lot of young people that are going to struggle with jobs and, and, and employment, really, because the economics are going to get difficult. And then you think what situation at home is. So how is life going to really look like in that place? And I don't think it's about this centre saying they're going to do it. It's about this centre thinking of, well, we're really good at this part of the problem. So we're going to do this really well. And this, you know, my vision in MCB is that we really coordinate our problem solving. You know, who's going to take what bit of the pie? So you know locally, this is what you're strong at. This is what people come to you. But I think it's also about what's the blind spot? What have we not thought about? And you'll only get that when you do feedback and critical analysis and you sound out, you know, because we, we all love to know that we are doing a good job. But it's also good to kind of like put the feelers out as to, well, have you heard about us? Do you know what we do? You know, what's, so being a bit critical about your own journey and thinking about what's coming up next. But I think it's about looking at the next five to 10 years, looking at the changes. If there's a recession coming that's going to impact people at home, depression, you know, how the re interpersonal relationships, breakdown of the family. And the breakdown of the family, I would say, is probably one of our biggest problems, aside from all the other. The breakdown of the family is the root. The symptoms is everything you see. When family unit is not strong, when there isn't a strong male role model or a female role model, there isn't that kind of feeling of love and nurturing at home, then people look elsewhere. And so I think it's about that. And so I think nationally we're looking at where are the, the critical areas we need to be across. So obviously strengthening communities, policy and advocacy, and building the institution, our sustainability. Because we're a very resource rich community, but we don't really kind of share and coordinate. So yeah, so I don't know if that answered that. I was like lots of, <laughs> was that helpful? <laughs>